Ikke ved kan er i øyene. På Afrikas fastland lar Europa sine egne kortsiktige interesser gå foran prinsipper om menneskerettighet og fred. Velkommen til Sandfast, vår podcast om Vestsahara, den siste kolonien på det afrikanske kontinent. I de okkuperte områdene av Vestsahara bygger den marokkanske kongen personlige energiselskap, store parker med vindmøller. I dag skal vi snakke om hvordan fornybar energi har blitt et hinder for å løse Vestsahara-konflikten. Dagens gjest er Sara Eikmann, som er koordinator av den internationella forening Western Sahara Resource Watch. Sara, welcome. Hello, Asriya. And I know you have been like a long weekend with the meeting, so I'm, I'm very happy and grateful that you are squeezing me in between. It's always nice to talk to you, so, so it's a treat. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So, first, I mean, we just mentioned Resource Watch. What is actually Resource Watch? Okay, so Western Sahara Resource Watch is essentially a network of, of individuals who together campaign and research business interests in occupied Western Sahara. Because we believe that as long as Morocco is allowed to profit financially and politically uh, from its untenable presence there, its military presence there, uh, that the conflict is not going to be resolved through through a peace process because Morocco is not taking it seriously. So this started, it seems like, forever. Sometimes it feels very fresh and sometimes it feels like we've been doing this for ages, but it started like 16 years ago with, uh, I think, a coordination on the phosphates and on the, on the oil exploration at the time. And that has morphed into agriculture, salt, renewable energy, what we're going to talk about today, and a number of issues. But essentially what we're trying to do is, is to stop the plunder uh, in the hope that your people will be able to exercise self-determination. Mm. And I mean, we are sitting now and in front of you is one, two, three, four, six copies <laughs> <laughs> of a, a beautifully designed um, report um, and it says Greenwashing. Greenwashing occupation. Uh, Greenwashing occupation. And not only the design, the the content is brilliant. And I recommend everyone to read it. But and in that report and in your work, Resource Watch, you are your association is very critical to renewable energy projects in Western Sahara. Could you speak about the dilemmas or the problems that uh, you are concerned with? Yeah, okay, maybe first to give like a baseline on what we're talking about here. If you were to take like a screenshot today of renewable energy projects in Morocco and then the ones in Western Sahara, then what you see today as operational wind and and solar farms is still quite modest in Western Sahara. But if you look at what is under construction and what the plans are towards the 2030 horizon, so the year 2030, you see that Western Sahara, in terms of energy generation, becomes very important to Morocco. Like just on wind energy, we are talking about more than 50%. So by 2030, if everything goes ahead as scheduled, and that is of course always an issue in itself, but if all goes as planned, by 2030, the share of wind energy generated in Western Sahara will represent more than 50% of the wind energy that Morocco is generating. In terms of solar, it's a little bit more modest and it's also a little bit more difficult to to understand. There's a lot happening on the solar and I understand that that Mazen, the Moroccan agency which has taken the lead over the renewable energy projects, there are some issues internally, particularly in relation to solar energy, But there as well, Western Sahara may by 2030 represent about 33% of Morocco's total solar energy generation. So that is a lot. And if you consider that, there are of course a few few dilemmas or or problems that emerge from that basic assumption or realization. First of all, the energy projects that are already operational today serve to provide the energy that Morocco needs to plunder other resources. So for instance, the, uh, the Fumel Wed wind farm, which is a 50 megawatt wind farm, that provides all the energy that Fosboukra needs 
to run. So the excavation, transport to the port and everything. So that runs practically entirely on wind energy. FTSAT, which is a bigger farm, which is 200 megawatt, also services industrial end users. And you see this also, you notice that this is, that this is a subject, that this is an objective. For instance, if you look at Noor Dakhla, which is just still in the planning phase right now, but the fact that the location will be close to the agricultural sites tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. So that is a problem. It is also a problem that Morocco will become dependent in part on Western Sahara for the energy it needs. It means that it entrenches in a way Morocco's occupation or its need to, to be present in the territory just for its own energy needs. There's also the, the dream of Morocco to be able to sell renewable energy to Mauritania, yeah. to, to, to different European countries, to the EU as a whole. That, of course, means that the political position of these countries on Western Sahara will have to take that element into consideration. So again, it is, it is making the whole peace process a lot more difficult. And I think that is ultimately what is, what is our main concern uh, with regard to renewable energy. It is undermining the peace process because Morocco has a need, a further need to be present in the territory. Adding to that, that the king of Morocco himself is profiting on the back of these wind farms. There is a company called Nareva, which has all the, 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 the current wind farms in Western Sahara in its portfolio. So if the king of Morocco himself is allowed to profit personally of these projects, he's not going to have an incentive to really take UN peace process very credible. So it's a big development and it's one that is not receiving the attention that it needs. But yeah, it is one that definitely deserves to be raised a lot more. And especially now, yeah. with all that is happening in the world, and yeah. But um, I just want to say one thing: we are sitting in a random room. There is uh, some natural noises, and others, <laughs> someone is vacuuming outside. So I'm just sorry for the people who are listening. <laughs> um, but uh, which companies are behind this? I mean, you mentioned the Moroccan king, yeah. Of course, uh, on the Moroccan side, um, there's, a, there's a couple of, of, of government agencies which, which always take part in these contracts. That's usually the electricity agency ONE and now increasingly MASN, which is kind of a hybrid thing. It's a very peculiar thing. It's, it's, uh, I think it's privately owned but publicly funded, which is a, which is a special thing in itself. Yeah. And then there is Nareva, which is uh, a wind energy company, which is then in the portfolio of the Moroccan monarchy. I think initially uh, there was a need for Morocco to find you know, expertise in renewable energy outside of Morocco proper. So you see a few bigger names come into, come into play, like Siemens. Siemens is one of the bigger ones. If you look at the currently operational wind farms, there's, a, there's for each and every one of them a connection to Siemens. They're all running on wind turbines provided by Siemens. Another company is Enel from Italy, which has a special contract with uh, the Moroccan government to install five wind farms, and two of those are in Western Sahara. One of them is at present being built, is in Bujdur. It's the biggest wind farm in Western Sahara to date. It's 300 megawatt. That is huge. That is the same size as the Tarfaya wind park, which is internationally regarded as one of the bigger, bigger wind farms in the world. But this one's going to be equally big. And that's then in the portfolio of Enel. And those are like, uh, you also have Aqua, uh, which, is, which is from the Gulf region and which, which was responsible for the solar farms. Mm -hmm. And these are then the main names. But then you have like a second wave of companies which come after these bigger names, which, which then tend to be involved in well, the, the, the basic construction of the wind farm or the transport of, of, of the windmills, putting on special chemicals on these windmills because, of course, you know, the, the desert has, has, has its own uh, circumstances and so to have this protected layer on, on, these, on these windmills. So there's a whole industry that pulls in on the back of the basic construction of yeah. the farms as well. And, and some of these countries, they are very 
not countries, companies that mm -hmm. are very well international, like Siemens. Oh yeah, yeah. And before uh, before we go to the next question, question of uh, how do they get away with this and what are their arguments, I'm listening to you and you just can drop all these details mm -hmm. and. Because I'm like, how do you find this? Because I'm sure it's not just, yeah, like working the scenes behind such a report or such a research for, yeah. Um, it has not been easy, to be honest with <laughs> yeah. you. Well, particularly with Siemens, we have like a history of now 10 years since we first came across the Siemens development on, on Fumel Wed. So that's like almost a subject in itself. But to find out what is happening on the ground or what the plans are is incredibly difficult, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You would imagine that the Moroccan agencies which are in charge of this particular sector would have updated information that does not contradict each other. And that's not the case. So you can go to the website of Mazen and you will find something on a wind farm that you will not find on the Olney website and, and so forth. So it's very, very difficult to find all that information. I also find that in general, companies have become more careful in their communication mm -hmm. when they are involved in this type of project. Siemens, not so much. I mean, <laughs> to, to date, it will still refer to Bushdur as in Western Sahara, for, uh, sorry, as in Morocco, for instance. Yeah. But there are other companies w who would not even mention Western Sahara or a city when they say they have a contract with, um, with Orne or Mazen for, let's say, a substation to a wind farm. And they will simply give a description of a project that they will do in Morocco. And then, of course, it, it, that means that you will already have to have some kind of a background knowledge on what projects are in the pipeline and can this correspond to something that I saw elsewhere in relation to Western Sahara. Try to match all of these different elements together. Try to contact the company on, on, on the basis of something substantial. And then in the end, you know, sometimes it's, yes, we are indeed involved there, <laughs> you know, without without trying to step into yeah. the geolocation um, swamp that, that comes with Western Sahara. So it's very, very difficult really to, to find out who is involved and who is doing what. I do think that what we have in the report is the most updated uh, information that you will find. We've used Moroccan sources for obvious reasons because they're the ones that are running these projects. But also maybe to give you an indication on how fast things change and how fast this development goes. I, I feel like I've lived with this report for a very long time. Yeah. And so I was really happy when we published it in early October last year. And then three weeks after, things had already changed. So in our report, we make reference, when we try to give the overview, we make reference to a wind farm that is planned in Safi in Morocco proper. And then three weeks after the launch of our report, the news leaks that this particular wind farm, which is in the portfolio of a company that is owned by the Prime Minister of Morocco, the millionaire Mr. Aziz Akhanouch, mm. is now going to be located in Dakhla. So that's how fast things can change all of a sudden. What are their arguments? How do they get away yeah. with it when it's very clear? Yeah, and... Uh, Actually, in writing this report, we, we came up with an idea for our website, which is now one of the elements in our website that I maybe cherish the most, and, and people can go and have a look at it. It's, it's all the way at the bottom of the website, and it's called How the Companies Argue, okay. because they don't tend to be quite original. And after you've been doing this for a while, whether it's, it's on the phosphate sector or the fishery sector or now renewable energy, you, you see that there are elements which always come back in their line of reasoning. So we tried to summarize it there, but some of the main ones are, particularly for renewable energy, we're not actually taking anything away. We're not removing any resources. We're not doing any excavation. Or, mm -hmm. so, so we're not doing that. And that might be true, but they are providing the energy that the other industries need to, um, to do the excavation and, yeah. and to remove the finite resources. So that is, that is their counter argument that you, can, that you can make. Another thing is uh, we don't take any position on international law. That's a classic across all the sectors. And what is wrong with that answer? You would, you would say 
that to do a, a business activity in Western Sahara, which is a non-self-governing territory with no administering, administering power attached to it or appointed to it, and you're doing that with Morocco, that is sort of taking a position on international law. That's almost akin to saying, we do think that Morocco has a fair claim here. You're not spelling it out, but that's essentially what you're implying. Mm -hmm. That's another thing which, also, which always comes back. Um, oh, yeah, we don't do politics. That's another one. <laughs> which you <laughs> it's can, always funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which you can then refer back to, of course, with, um, with, the, previous, with the previous answer I've yeah. given. But there's a number of these, these, these catchphrases which get thrown around a lot um, and, and which makes absolutely no sense when you really, really study it. And, and, what's, and what's Morocco is throwing around, <laughs> around the, in a sense is that they are, I mean, how is it possible that Morocco is able to report projects in Western Sahara to the UN? Oh, okay. Is, is that even possible? I mean, I, maybe I can, if answer coming from the company, I'm like, yeah, okay, but from the UN? I know it is quite shocking. Yeah. It is quite shocking. Um, so you have a body called the UNFCCC. Uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and it's in that framework, you know, that the different COP meetings that we always see every year in the media, where all the countries gather and then pat themselves on the back that they're saving the climate. Now, so in that framework, you had the, the Paris Agreement. And as part of the Paris Agreement, the, the, the parties to the UNFCCC agreed that they re would report on what they are doing to well, mitigate, I guess we should say, climate change because we're not going to stop it anymore at this point. So you do that through an NDC, nationally, nationally, important word, determined contribution. So what Morocco is doing, it is providing this, this NDC to the UNFCCC secretariat. And it's, it's, it's not actually saying that it's doing anything Western Sahara, of course, because Western Sahara doesn't exist for Morocco, but it enlists the wind farms and the solar plants and everything else as part of what it is doing to mitigate climate change. You would expect a UN body to adhere to like the central UN position, which to date still is. It's a non-self-governing territory with no administering power in place. Yeah. So the UNFCCC takes in this information and really does not do anything with it. We contacted them. And this episode to me was like, do you know the emoji with the exploding brain? Do you know yeah, that yeah. emoji? Yeah. That in a way describes a bit my feeling towards this particular episode. Because if you go to the website of the Secretariat of the UNFCCC, it says that their mandate is to review the information submitted by the parties. So it takes them a few months to come back to us with an, an answer to our question. Like, why are you accepting this from Morocco and Western Sahara? And the response was one sentence, and it said, we do not have a mandate to review <laughs> information submitted yeah. by the parties. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, exploding I the brain. emotion. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, this, this makes very little sense. We, we've, we've gone back to them saying, okay, so how do you interpret review? And then it's, we don't assess. Additionally, this is, this is really kind of awful because... It is a UN body doing this. It, Morocco is here allowing to inflate its credentials on climate change. It's, it's sort of seen as a model country in, in some arenas. But that is artificially created because if you take out the Western Sahara a bit, it looks less impressive. But on the back of that also comes that Morocco gets access to a whole lot of funding opportunities for its operations in Western Sahara. And to contrast, the Sahrawis, and particularly the refugees, who have no access to any funding, are among the first victims of the worst aspects of climate change. And this coming from a, from a UN body is, is frankly astounding. So I really, really hope, and I saw that the Sahrawi government did its own uh, NDC, which is such a show, also a display of, of statemanship mm -hmm. from the, gov the exiled government. So that is really good, and I really do hope that there are governments out there who are willing to address this with the UNFCCC. Nobody else is allowed to do this, okay? It's not, Germany cannot say, we are building wind farms in Austria, and yeah, we're going airport, to include yeah. this in our NDC. 
Yeah. Nobody is allowed to do it, but Morocco is allowed to get away with it. So I really hope that governments address it. Governments can address it. They can say, we think that this particular state is not fairly or correctly reporting. So I really do hope that there are states out there who are willing to, to do this. Because it's away from us as a high, it's a question of transparency. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And also, it's it's so unfair. It's literally only Morocco doing this. Um, we, we tried to find out whether there are any other uh, examples like like is is Russia reporting on stuff it's doing in Crimea, for instance? I can't I can't find any. It's, it's there's a big difference in the way that these 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 NDCs are formulated. But in the case of Morocco, it is so blatantly obvious that they're including it, and it should be fairly simple for a UN body to say, no, we're not going to accept it. Sarah, I see you are getting angry now. You are the emoji yeah, <laughs> yeah, itself. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been I've been in this for for such a long yeah. time, and I think maybe it's good that I still have the capacity to be shocked because, you know, if you've been hitting your head against the same wall for a very long time, you get tired. But <laughs> no, but it is so grotesquely unfair that yeah, I still get angry about it. What do you think, people who are listening, whether they are researcher or activist or environment environment yeah what they can do in order to bring because as you said the the report is brilliant it has brilliant content so how where can they find the report but also how can they use the data that it's mm -hmm. yeah. mm. okay so on our website wsrw.org uh, you will fairly quickly spot the report. We put it as a top article mm. still. We'll soon probably be replaced by an upcoming report. But you can find all our reports on our website. So, I mean, it's it's freely available. So so please do not hesitate to, to have a look. And, and I think the one thing that people who agree on the basic principle that companies or governments should not impede uh, the Sahrawi's rights to at one point exercise self-determination... The point is to, first of all, make a lot of noise about this, because the point here, and again, the mission statement of Resource Watch is to try and stop companies participating in this. The thing is, you are not going to convince a profit-oriented entity on a moral argument. You're not going to sway them that way. You're going to have to come up with something that hits on that profit margin. Companies who are on a stock exchange are very sensitive to their reputation. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important that they get called out on social media, in AGMs, mm -hmm. in media, through protests. I was so incredibly happy to see Sakharawis just this week inside the AGM of Siemens Gamesa in Spain and outside protesting, like saying Siemens, because the one question Siemens will not answer is that of consent, if you're not asking us directly, we're coming here to tell you. We do not want you in our homeland. And that is so phenomenally important. You immediately saw uh, there were a few very interesting news articles which appeared afterwards, even in, in, business, in business articles, business journals, which reported on the entire AGM of Siemens Gamesa. But the top part of the articles was like, we did not see this coming. <laughs> Nobody was expecting Western Sahara to take up a substantial part of the AGM, because Siemens Gamesa has issues in, in other areas. But then there was Western Sahara, and it took up a major share of the agenda. And that's the way to do it. You know, keep calling out these companies. Keep mentioning them. Keep you know, bringing your grievances to them. Keep confronting them. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, because we do see that investors are taking note, we had, we always thought, you know, a company like Siemens is too big to, to take on. Siemens is everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. If you have a vacuum cleaner in your home or like an electric toothbrush, you know, there's a chance that you have a Siemens thing in your life. Too big to take on. But then we saw early last year that Storebrand in Norway mm -hmm. pulled out of yeah. Siemens. That was such a major issue. That was so incredibly important. And they did it for all the right reasons on Western Sahara. And we sense in the investment community that it's sort of catching on, that it's not because this is a, a, a renewable resource that the principle should be different than towards a finite resource, something that can be depleted. So it is catching on. But if you want to move investors, you need to keep making noise. So I, I would really encourage people to, to just keep doing that. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. 
my Thank- my explosion emoji <laughs> Thank you Astrid it's been a joy Hvis du vil lære mer om konflikten gå til vest-sahara.no